All right, so we're on to the chemicals and some of the hardware as well. So we're going to start with labware. Have gloves, very useful. I'm wearing one right now. Um, so of course, what I've been talking about is the hot plate stir. Two settings, stirring and heating. Heating is very self-explanatory. Heating element on top of here. Stirring, as I've talked about before, is that rotating magnet that causes that little tablet-shaped thing to follow that magnetic field and stir without contacting the fluid directly. Very, very useful thing. I use it all the time. Of course, I have these ring stands. They're basically like uh, plug and play. You have these little uh, clamps with a little uh, fitting on here. Just slide it in and then can tighten it and it's going to stay in place. So I have these uh, standard claw fittings. These are useful for test tubes, uh, for really anything in general. I have this ring stand right here. And so this ring stand is useful for separatory funnels. And they're also useful when you want to heat something in the middle. This is a more uh, specified clamp. This will clamp onto the barrettes. This will clamp onto test tubes. And it's actually a little bit better than a claw clamp, but you can get by with one of those as well. And of course, uh, in every lab, there must be a scale because we don't measure things in teaspoons and cups. We measure things in grams. So it's just a scale, nothing too much to talk about there. Now we're on to the cool stuff. We're going to start out with acids because acids are really cool. So um, I extract a lot of these acids because unfortunately, you really can't get any of the cool acids like nitric acid or at this point sulfuric acid because of federal regulations on drug making and stuff like that. But I have here, I've extracted muriatic or hydrochloric acid. This is technical grade uh, just because it's kind of impure, but it's, it's good for any sort of purpose I want, like um, getting gas evolution from calcium carbonate or chlorine evolution from trichloroisocyanuric acid or really any sort of uh, generator application. Sodium bisulfate, that's from pool, pH decreaser, so this is good. It's still technical grade, but it's a good acid. Of course, vinegar, because vinegar is an acid. And of course, when I was visiting a multi-ethnic market, I found 25% acetic acid. Now, this is 5%, so this is really, really cool. Um, but for the hardcore people out there, I have glacial acetic acid. Now, what you might not know is that this vinegar is super dilute. This stuff is really concentrated and actually in this form it is quite dangerous. That's why I keep it in a bag to keep out the smell and also because to keep myself safe as well. All right, so we have some other stuff. Boric acid from Roach Killer, I think. Uh, really useful stuff. Ferric chloride, so this is PCB etchant. I made this myself using steel wool, hydrogen peroxide, and this technical grade acid. And I've used this uh, quite a few times when I made my own PCBs. And uh, just going around in my local hardware store, not in Home Depot, they have sulfuric acid drain opener. Uh, actually, this stuff, in my own opinion, works better than any sort of alkalinic drain opener, but it's incredibly aggressive and dangerous. But in my purposes, I use them both as a drain opener and something uh, to extract unpure sulfuric acid from, because sulfuric acid is quite a rare commodity. Speaking of sulfuric acid, we have some right here, 98% H2SO4. Now, this stuff is actually quite dense. It is much heavier than you expect this bottle to be. And it's very dangerous. If you put some on your arm, it's going to melt uh, through your skin. It's actually going to char because it wants water so badly. It's going to pull it from your organic molecule. But it is a very useful acid. So I guess that's one thing going for it. All right. So moving on to general chemical storage. So what do you expect in here? Well, general chemicals, of course. So without going through the entire list of stuff, you actually see um, some of my Chinese takeout containers come in. Now this is sucrose, and as some people might know it, it's table sugar. And over the years when I've worked with these chemicals, uh, working on limited budgets, working on limited availabilities, I learned uh, which sort of chemicals you can find in store, which sort of things you can purify. For example, I found copper sulfate pentahydrate. Now I spent around five bucks to buy this entire thing, which is crazy because this is actually root killer found in Home Depot. Uh, so this stuff is great for growing the crystal that I have around my neck right here. That's a copper sulfate crystal. And it's also good for all other uh, ion exchange experiments or whatever. Really, really nice stuff. I have some more in the back as well. I have uh, some desiccants and some really just salts, ammonium chloride, all that uh, stuff in the back. Not really important stuff. Uh, but I use them a lot so I keep them in high quantity. And down here we're into the more specified chemicals. 
We have stuff like iodine, iodine solution. We have cobalt chloride. So this is good for as a preservative or whatever. Um, so here we have some cupric chloride. Um, and we have some, some more interesting stuff like calcium carbide. So this is stuff that miners used to use when they put them in water and create these acetylene gases for their torches. So um, cool stuff like that. And we have aerogel. Now this container is actually incredibly light because aerogel is one of the lightest solid substances on earth. And it's very good insulation as well. I just have this more of a gimmick sample, uh, but I also use this as waterproofing. If you rub aerogel on your hands, it's gonna make it waterproof for, for a bit. Um, okay, so let's move on to some things that I've made myself. I have here a sample of phthalic anhydride. When I try to make luminol from uh, vinyl gloves, thanks to Nerdridge's uh, advice, I ended up getting phthalic anhydride. Now I wasn't able to make the hydrazine sulfate, more of a safety concern when I uh, wanted to mix uh, chlorine bleach and ammonia together. So I kind of stopped at this step, but I still have some of this cool chemical left. All right, so let's move over to the bases. Now bases are opposite of acids. That's why I store them across from each other. So if there's a spill, there's not gonna be a real big reaction. Here I have some sodium silicate. So this stuff is actually sold as a concrete sealer because it does that really well. Actually, it seals glass as well. I once left a little bit of that stuff in my beaker and now I'm not able to use that beaker anymore. It's solidified and it basically stuck. This is useful when you wanna make polymerizations, basically liquid glass, that's what it's called. I have ammonium hydroxide lab grade, so none of that weak store-bought stuff. Sodium hydroxide, that is uh, one of the ubiquitous chemicals you find in any lab, so I have a lot of this stuff. Uh, this is lab grade, so any sort of uh, titrations or whatnot. All right, so down here we have the oxidizers. Uh, and oxidizers are what you think they are. They actually provide oxygen, so they are decently dangerous in themselves. Now this is hydrogen peroxide. Not any of this stuff. This stuff is weak. This is 30%, so 10 times more concentrated than your average thing you can buy at the drugstore. This is very useful for gimmick experiments like elephant toothpaste, but it's also useful for other oxidization experiments as well. I have stuff like potassium permanganate. I have bulk potassium permanganate is a green sand iron filter um, regenerant. So this, this stuff was actually sold real cheap, so I have a lot of it, and it's really good to demonstrate stuff like potassium permanganate glycerin reactions. Ammonium nitrate, this stuff, is a regulated compound and I got this before they were cracking down on uh, bomb making or whatever so this was actually found in cold packs and I purified this to get high, uh, higher purity crystals as well. Silver nitrate is very useful it is expensive because it is made out of silver but you, you can see some cool experiments like silver trees or uh, making silver azide or silver mirrors stuff like that. Alright so moving on to solvents I have methyl ethyl ketone. I got really lucky at Lowe's once and I found this specialty thinner. Uh, if I bought it online, this would have cost like 80 or $90. Ended up spending like 15. Acetone, very, very useful in the lab. Yeah, I, I get this from Home Depot all the time. Ethyl acetate, this is more of a laboratory grade um, chemical, which I use in solvent extraction processes. Of course I have isopropanol. That's the stuff you find in rubbing alcohol. And I have ethyl alcohol. Now, they do not sell pure ethyl alcohol because of uh, health concerns and stuff like that. So they always denature it. Um, and it typically doesn't affect your chemistry at all. And here I have some xylene, I have some turpentine, all that stuff typically not used directly for chemistry, but for solvent extractions or uh, whatnot as well. All right, so we're on to our final few sections here. This is in the back of the lab, and this is where I store all my extension cords and my tubes. Now these tubes are useful when I want to draw a vacuum or these rubber tubes are useful when I want to do distillation experiments. So I actually connect this right to the hose. That was before I started looking into pump-based distillation. I used to just run the sink continuously, which was a bad practice. So now I just use a pump, and so this has served me very well. Now we must iterate again that safety is number one, and here's my safety box. Now the lid itself is actually a safety shield, and so this is when I want to test uh, stuff like um, uh, gas evolving or potentially explosive compounds outdoors. I just use a shield behind me. It really hasn't served a purpose yet, which is fortunate, but it will protect against some debris if necessary. And here is my safety box. 
And in here I have some eye wash, which is just a saline solution. I have burn relief and I have some bottled water. So bottled water is good for drinking, but um, if I wanna uh, dilute something, this is also useful as well. I have a um, alkaline wash. So this is when I have an acid spill. I can just dump this right on top of here. I have additional pairs of safety goggles just in case. And I have a gas mask. Now this gas mask has saved me multiple times. One of the incidents that I talked about before is when that bathroom fan actually failed when I pumped too much hydrogen chloride vapor to it. And so now there was a lot of this corrosive vapor throughout the room and I had to turn this off. Um, so I just grabbed this gas mask and I was completely fine. All right, so we're gonna end with uh, the incident that I promised I would talk to you about, the only time I've ever used a fire extinguisher. And so this was actually me back in fifth grade. I was making some negative X. So negative X is a mixture of ammonium nitrate, ammonium chloride catalyst, and zinc metal. And so this compound is water sensitive. And of course, little me didn't know that there was water in the air. So I actually made this on a humid summer day. I put this in a plastic container. So luckily it was in glass. I, I sealed it up. So it's one of those um, screw on containers with a lid. And I walked this way. Uh, to the front door. So this actually, at the time, this rug was a front door mat. Now, before I actually had a chance to go out the door, that stuff actually blew up. It caught this rug on fire. It was uh, burning. Um, and so you can actually see these burn marks. And they're actually gray because of the zinc powder in it. And actually, by sheer luck, I did not get hit because the fire extinguisher that I was holding in my arm got these spots of molten metal on it. So I was really, really lucky. And of course I used this fire extinguisher to put out the fire. And so this is always a story I put out there. Safety is number one priority. And when you're working with chemicals that can do that, you need to be very, very careful. I should have been wearing a face mask, which I wasn't. I should have done that. And I should have worn closed toed shoes, which I wasn't. Uh, but of course I was lucky. And now I have this cool souvenir rug. So see you in the next video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment.